Welcome to lecture number 68, Historical Topic 6.14, Continuity and Change in Period 6. This is the last lecture for this historical period. The learning objective is explain the extent to which industrialization brought change from 1865 to 1898. The first key concepts as technological advances, large-scale production methods, and the opening of new markets encouraged the rise of industrial capitalism in the United States. Some of the changes include new technologies like the Bessemer process for manufacturing steel, which fuels industrialization and new heavy industries. The wealth these new industries generate create a new class of captains of industry and robber barons. The form of capitalism the United States adopts is reliant on railroads for transportation and wage labor for manufacturing. Continuities are seen in the similarities of how the attempts in annexing Hawaii were similar to previous Western expansion efforts to gain access to new raw materials and new consumers. The other continuity is that industrialization had already started in the early 19th century during the market revolution. The next key concept says large-scale industrial production accompanied by massive technological change, expanding international communication networks, and pro-growth government policies generated rapid economic development and business consolidation. The business consolidation is a new change in this period. Vertical and horizontal integration were ways to maximize efficiency in a company and eliminate competitors. Horizontal integration begins in the railroad industry and is adopted in other industries. Vertical integration was used by Carnegie in the steel industry, which allowed him to gain the largest market share. Trust and interlocking directorates were used to expand market share in an industry while skirting laws against monopolies. Improvements in communication come with the expansion of telegraph lines. Telegraph cables are installed along rail lines, and later, a transatlantic telegraph line is laid, connecting North America to Europe. One continuity is that the government continues to encourage economic growth through subsidies and protective tariffs. Railroads were the main beneficiaries of the land subsidies, while manufacturers benefited from higher tariffs. There's also a lack of regulation in these new industries. The government claimed that they were trying to follow a laissez-faire approach whenever it was convenient for the industrialists. The other continuity is that the South is lagging behind in its industrialization behind the North. There are attempts at industrialization and advocates for a new South, like Henry Grady, but ultimately it doesn't really happen. The next key concept says a variety of perspectives on the economy and labor developed during a time of financial panics and downturns. The change in this period is the rise of labor unions. The Knights of Labor and the American Federation of Labor organized strikes for better pay, shorter hours, and safer working conditions. Some of the major strikes in this period include the Pullman Strike, the Haymarket Strike, and the Homestead Strike. The unions attempt to gain collective bargaining rights, which means that the union can negotiate a contract for all workers in a company, and sometimes an entire industry. It gives workers more leverage when negotiating because if their demands are not met, all workers may strike or boycott their employer. As for continuities, the economy still experiences financial panics, a lot of them caused by overspeculation. Earlier in the century, they were being caused by overspeculation in Western land. That is still sometimes the case. Financial panics in this period are also caused by overspeculation in stocks of railroad companies. Farmers continue to experience large debts and are subject to low crop prices. They now advocate for an inflationary monetary policy. They want the use of greenbacks or the coinage of silver to make their debts less burdensome. The next key concept says new systems of production and transportation enabled consolidation within agriculture, which along with periods of instability spurred a variety of responses from farmers. The main response from farmers in this period was the creation of the Grange and the Farmers Alliance. These are collective groups that advocated specifically for farmers. They have limited success in passing Granger laws in the West and parts of the South. However, their impact is limited and some of the laws are ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. For the continuities, farming continues the path that started during the market revolution and continues to be more mechanized. It leads to higher crop yields, which will lead to falling prices for crops, which ultimately hurts farmers, though it helps consumers. The next key concept says, the migrations that accompanied industrialization transformed both urban and rural areas of the United States and caused dramatic social and cultural change. As the key concept suggests, the change is the new wave of immigration. Migrants settle in cities and therefore cities grow faster than ever before. Immigrant groups settle in ethnic enclaves like Chinatowns and Little Italy's where they are able to retain some portion of their identity and culture while at the same time slowly assimilating into American culture. For continuities, the Irish immigrants in the middle of the century had settled in cities too. As far as internal migration, the Western migration continued, so much so that the frontier had disappeared. Frederick Jackson Turner's frontier thesis worried that the source of innovation that the frontier provided was now gone and a new chapter in American history had begun. The next couple of key concepts continue to delve into immigration. The next one says, international and internal migration increased urban populations and fostered the growth of a new urban culture. 
The change here is that the new wave of immigration was coming largely from southern and eastern Europe. During the middle of the 19th century, it was coming mostly from Ireland and Germany. Nativists also get their first act of exclusion of an immigrant group through Congress with the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. The nativist sentiment is the same from before, but it had never risen to the level to where a specific group was barred from entry. The last key concept on migration says, larger numbers of migrants move to the West in search of land and economic opportunity, frequently provoking competition and violent conflict. American expansion into the West causes conflict with Native Americans. This is very similar to previous periods when Americans migrated West and displaced Natives. But the biggest change here is that now railroads are making it a lot easier for Americans to get out West, and therefore settlers migrate in greater numbers. U.S. Army troops are also sent in larger numbers to protect the settlers at the expense of Native Americans. New deposits of precious metals are found and extracted. Comstock Lode was the largest silver deposit found in the U.S., and in the Black Hills, gold is found. As miners were making their way over, they further displaced Native Americans. Conflict with Native Americans over land was nothing new, though the group that the U.S. was displacing was different than in previous periods. Plains Indians, primarily the Sioux, resisted American expansion in killing off of their primary resource, the bison. One of the major battles in which the Sioux were victorious was the Battle of Little Bighorn, though by the end of the century, most tribes had been weakened and forced onto reservations. The major legislation that dispossessed Native Americans of a lot of their land was the Dawes Act of 1887. It split up all American Indian land and distributed among heads of households to force American Indians to abandon communal property practices. The leftover land was sold to white settlers without any say from the tribes affected. The next key concepts delved into cultural movements. The Gilded Age produced a new cultural and intellectual movements, public reform efforts, and political debates over the economic and social policies. Some of the brand new movements that were not seen before include the conservation movements. Yellowstone National Park is designated as the first national park in 1872 as a result of the advocacy of conservationists. Social Darwinism was adapted from Darwin's original observations on the evolution of various species and applied to business and people. It was used to support a lack of regulation by the government and the economy and to justify racial discrimination. The Gospel of Wealth, proposed by Andrew Carnegie, advocated for wealthy individuals to engage in philanthropy. Finally, populism, a movement that asked for greater government intervention to help lower economic classes, especially farmers. Groups that make up the continuities are the temperance movement that had been active in the early 19th century and the women's right movement, still led by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. The other continuity is African Americans seeking equality. The movement is the same, the desires are the same, but the reformers are new. Whereas before Frederick Douglass was the most visible advocate for equality, the new voices and faces are W.E.B. Du Bois, Booker T. Washington, and Ida B. Wells. Despite having the same end goal, there is a lot more debate on the method for attaining equality. The next key concept says, new cultural and intellectual movements both buttressed and challenged the social order of the Gilded Age. For changes, there is a growth of popular culture. People have more disposable time and more disposable income. They're buying newspapers and magazines, so they're exposed to the same things. Spectator sports grow in popularity. The big one is baseball, and cities across the country have their own professional teams. There are circuses and variety shows like Buffalo Bill's Wild West. There's also new styles of architecture called Prairie Style, made popular by Frank Lloyd Wright. There are new movements in literature like the Naturalist Movement with Jack London's White Fang or the Realist Movement with Mark Twain. For continuities, there is a continued attempt at assimilation. Nativists insist that immigrants take on American culture and the idea of the melting pot is developed. Schools with a specific purpose to assimilate Native Americans are founded and some funded by the federal government. The first and most famous example of this is Carlisle School by William Henry Pratt. The last key concept says dramatic social changes in the period inspired political debates over citizenship, corruption, and the proper relationship between business and government. For the change, the Supreme Court settles the question on birthright citizenship in the court case U.S. v. Wong Kim Ark. It says that if someone is born in the United States, regardless of their parents' ancestry or status, they are U.S. citizens. Jim Crow laws are part of a long pattern of laws that limited freedoms of African Americans prior to the Civil War. The main legislation that accomplished this were the slave codes. During Reconstruction and the Redeemed South, they passed black codes. Now, Jim Crow laws are deemed constitutional by the Supreme Court case Plessy v. Ferguson, and it established the doctrine of separate but equal. The continuities include the patronage system. In the earlier part of the century, it is called the spoil system, especially used in the Jackson administration, though it is expanded by political machines. Finally, here's the recap. 
One of the biggest developments in this period is the growth of industrial capitalism, and that was followed by some economic issues like the growing gap between the rich and the poor, the debate on currency and the gold standard, and the continued panics that plagued the United States from overspeculation. There's a growth of the middle class which fuels a growth of consumer culture and new amusements. And finally, there's a continuity in the treatment of immigrants, Native Americans, and African Americans. Thank you for watching. If you would like to watch the next lecture, you can click on the video link on the screen. And if you're looking for more practice to help you on the AP exam, you can visit apushlights.com. I wish you the very best in all of your studying and look forward to seeing you back on the next lecture.